Well, hello, everyone. I have a question for you today. Where did man come from? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Well, hi, I'm Brian Ashpole, pastor of Honolulu Assembly of God here in beautiful Honolulu, near world famous Diamond Head. And let's think about that question. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Well, of course, there are two options. We either It's either about evolution or it's about creation. And the Genesis record, first book of the Bible says, God created man, formed man out of the dust of the ground. Well, there's a cute little story about a little boy who was sent to bed for the night, and he was pretty restless. He wasn't ready to go to sleep, so he's looking all around his room, and finally he looks under his bed, and he sees, wow, it hasn't been cleaned for a while. There's dust everywhere under his bed. So he calls his dad in and says, hey, dad, I have, I have a question. Is it true man was created out of the dust of the ground? Well, they believe that, so dad said yes. And he said, well, is it also true that when we die, we return to dust? Dad said, yeah, that's true also, son. Well, the boy said, Dad, you better look under my bed. There's a lot of dust there. Someone is either coming or going. Well, there was also a story about a little girl who climbed up on her grandmother's lap, and she looked at her grandma's white hair and all her grandma's wrinkles, and she asked, Grandma, did God make you? And gr Grandma said, yes. And then the little girl asked, Grandma, did God make me too? And the grandma answered, yes, he made you also. Well, said the little girl, don't you think he's doing a better job now than he used to? <laughs> well, that's pretty cute. But thankfully, God does a great job. He does a beautiful job on every person. You're a masterpiece. We're going to look at that more in just a moment. But let's look at what the Bible says, the Genesis record. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Verse 31, Genesis 1, 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Wow. Well, when we think about the beginning, we often have two questions. Where did I come from? And why am I here? Well, let's look at those two questions. Let's start with the first one. Where did I come from? And we're talking about the, uh, the question, how did God create man? And chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 is very specific. God formed man from the dust of the ground. God formed man from the dust of the ground. He fashioned man. He shaped man. Now, last week, we looked at the fact that the universe was created ex nihilo, out of that's the Latin word, or bara Hebrew, both being out of nothing. God spoke the word, and it was so. But man was formed by God's hands out of the dust of the ground. He fashioned man out of clay. In other words, God got down and dirty on the ground in the dirt to create man. He lovingly, expertly formed man. It's like the picture uh, uh, the work of a potter fashioning a vessel out of clay on a spinning wheel, a, a, a craftsman, an artisan doing that. See, this picture is God spoke the universe into existence. He spoke our world and everything into existence, he commanded it to be done, and, and it was so. But with man, he did not speak, friends. He did not command, but he lovingly formed man. He fashioned man out of the dust by his hands. David, the psalmist, writes this in Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16. He said, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now that's beautiful. And David is speaking a language of poetry. He knit me together in my mother's womb. I have a couple of daughters who are into knitting now. They make beautiful graces. They, they'll give us gifts and uh, they're so beautiful you, you don't want to use them, you know. They're, 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 they're too pretty. 
But David says very clearly here, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, verse 14. You, friends, are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, there are three truths out of, out of, that, uh, out of this passage that we're looking at. God created man, formed out of the depths of the ground. The three truths, uh, first one is this, you are not an accident of nature. You are not an accident of nature. Now, there's a big contrast, friends, when, between evolution and creation when we talk about origin. When it comes to origin, evolution tells us you were evolved from lower forms of life, start, maybe start out as amoeba, and then a slug, and a snail, and a squid, and a scorpion, uh, to a snake, and a salmon, and a seal, and a sea lion, a saber-toothed tiger, right? you know, a lot of great S's there. And then eventually, of course, it was the primates, monkeys and chimps and apes, and man was able to evolve out of that. It was the survival of the fittest, the ruthless world primitive animal instinct. That first man was half man and half ape. They were a genetic mistake, an accident, a mutant that stepped out of the primordial ooze. But the account of creation tells us a much different story, friends. God lovingly fashioned you. He breathed into you his breath of life. You became a living being. You're not a mistake. You are not an accident. On the contrary, your body is a masterpiece of exquisite design. You are a masterpiece. It's been said this way, beautifully injured, your body is governed by several hundred systems of control, each interacting with and affecting the other. Your brain... Your brain has 10 billion nerve cells to record what you see and hear. Not 10 million, 10 billion. Your skin has more than 2 million tiny sweat glands, about 3,000 per square inch, all part of the intricate system, which keeps your body at an even temperature. That way you don't get too hot or too cold, just right there around 98 degrees. You have a pump in your chest, your heart. Listen to this, friends. It makes your blood travel 168 million miles a day. That's amazing. Equivalent to 6,720 times around the world. That's what your heart is doing every day. Wow. And the lining of your stomach contains 35 million glands that secrete juices which aid in the process of digestion. These are just a few of the involved processes and chemical wonders which operate to sustain your life. Your body is intricate, it's precise. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So a young student had been impressed with the fact that most new products have some bugs that must be ironed out before they can operate officially. For example, computer software often has bugs. Uh, just this week, my laptop here in the office, uh, the church office updated, and uh, when it updated, all, then I, I couldn't access any of my files uh, or my programs. I had to restore it to a previous point. You know, so there are these bugs there. And as a student stood gazing at a chart showing organs and nerves and arteries and glands and the human body, how they work together, he suddenly exclaimed, just think, the first time God put it together, it worked. <laughs> Well, friends, you not only have a body that's a masterpiece of design and, and precision, but you also have a soul, you have a conscience, you have purpose, you have value. It's been said this way, man is a little bit of heaven and earth. You are a little bit of heaven and earth. You're a little bit of earth because you're formed from the dust of the ground, and when you die, your body will return to that dust. But you're a little bit of heaven. You receive the eternal breath of God. He breathed into nostril man. It's the ha, as the Hawaiians say, the breath. The, and it's the eternal breath of God. The result is, friends, you're now without end. You're immortal. Now, we're not eternal like God. That means no ending and no beginning. God, God had neither one of them. You had a beginning, but you, you won't end. You, you, you're without end. You're going to live forever. The question is, where are you going to live? Well, there's a big contrast between evolution and creation when it comes to origin, but also when it comes to intelligence. So evolution tells us that about two million years ago, give or take a few million, man began to eat fat, marrow, and, and other things that were good for him, and the brain started to grow rapidly, and the result was he began to develop intelligence. And you would expect that our human body would have a brain comparable in size to other similar-sized animals. But no, that's not the case. We do not have a 10-ounce brain like, like a similar sized animals. Now, maybe some of you watching this, you do have a 10-ounce brain. <laughs> Just teasing. 
you have almost a three pound brain. Your brain is almost three pounds, almost five times larger than a similar size animal. Man is unique among creation. See, the account of creation tells us a very different story than evolution. Adam, the first man, was not some Cro-Magnum prehistoric caveman with limited intelligence who grunted a lot and shrieked and bashed heads with a club barely removed from the apes that he evolved from. Instead, the Genesis record tells us that Adam, that first man, was intelligent, he was alert, he was articulate. You know, what was his first duty, friends? His first duty was to name all the animals. That tells us he has intelligence and, and a grasp of language and ability to reason. See, God did not make an animal parade in front of him and, and say, Hey, Adam, this is a giraffe and this kangaroo, and here's a hippo, and there's a tiger, and an elephant, and orangutan, and all these others. Stop me if I'm going too fast. Now the Bible tells us in Genesis 2.19, God brought the animals to Adam, what? To see what he would name them. He was smart. He was intelligent. So you're not an accident of nature, friends. The second truth, by contrast, you are the pinnacle of God's creation. You're the pinnacle of God's creation. Now what does a pinnacle mean? That's the peak, the, the summit or the highest point of a mountain. What an honor, friends. The strategy of creation as we read in Genesis 1 and 2, is to advance from blessed to more. And so man is created to last. He's a crowning glory of God's creation. What favor there is, as Matthew Henry, the great Bible commentator, writes, it was not fit for man to be placed in a palace designed for him until it was completely ready for him. Man, as soon as he was made, had the entire visible creation before him to contemplate and enjoy. Great statement from Matthew Henry. Well, friends, you, not, you are not only the pinnacle of creation, the third truth is this, you have value and purpose. You have value and purpose. See, uh, uh, evolutionists, the atheists, secularists, they're patronizing, condescending, telling you you're a genetic mistake, you're an accident of evolution, and we need to educate you, you don't know any better, we need you to understand and accept your condition, you can't help yourself, you can't control yourself, for example, if you're a teenager, you're going to have premarital sex, just make sure you use a condom, that if you have sex outside of marriage, you know, you're going to do it because you're in an accident, you can't help yourself, and if you have an accident with sex outside of marriage, well, then you take care of it with an abortion, you're no better than an animal. So when it comes to sex and alcohol and all these other things, yeah, that's risky behavior, but if you're going to do it, at least be safe, take precautions. On the contrary, friends, the Bible tells us we have been carefully fashioned by an all-powerful, loving, knowing God. Friends, he created us in his image. He breathed into us the breath of life. We're going to live forever. He created us in in us a soul. He gave us conscience. He gave us a desire, a longing to know him. He gave us intelligence and understanding. He gave us compassion and courage. He gave us the ability to live upright. What's more, his son gave his life to set you free from sin and death. See, Satan does not have jurisdiction over you. Sin does not have authority over you. You're not an animal with no self-control over your life and over your body. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So where did you come from? God created you in honor and glory. That's where you came from. Well, the second question is this. Why am I here? Why, why am I here? Why did God create man? And that's also three truths that we can find from Genesis chapter 1. And the first one is this. God created us, friends, to be in relationship with him. He created us to be in relationship with him. God desired someone to have someone to be in fellowship with him. Now, God is perfect in himself. He's complete within himself. There's this perfect communion in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But God chose to be in relationship with man. He wanted someone superior to all his previous creation. The stars, the world, the cows, the sheep, whales, all wonderful creation. Whales have a beautiful sound. But that's not who God was looking to be in relationship with. He, he wanted someone able to communicate with him, someone who could understand him, to love him. Now, animals can be devoted and faithful and caring. That's certainly true. I mean, if you own a pet, you know that. Dogs are man's best friend, but do all dogs go to heaven? <laughs> I don't know about that. They're not certainly not like man. Animals don't have a soul that can long for God. They don't have a heart that desires to worship him, a heart that desires to be in relationship with him. That's what man has, friends, mankind. That's what you have. It's mind-boggling. 
It's mind-boggling. The king who created the universe, think about it. The king who spoke the word and flung worlds into precise positions in space and everything in it and around it. That king wants to know you. He wants to be in relationship with you. Now you think about the great religions of the world, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, all the other ones. Maybe their goal is good. You do this, you do that, you do the other thing, you do all these things, and maybe you turn out okay. But there's no concept of having a relationship with, with God. There's no concept of having a relationship with your creator. God created you to be in relationship with him. The number two one, the second truth is this. God created you to glorify him, to give pleasure to him, to give praise to him. Man's greatest purpose, friends, is to praise and worship his creator. The church is at her best, the Christian is at his or her best when they're praising God and glorifying God with their words and with their life, not just on Sunday, but all through the week, 24-7. Exalt the Lord, lift him up. Be, and, and not only will you be lifting up in worship, but you will be strengthening yourself spiritually and it'll help you overcome the enemy. God created you to glorify himself. And he also, number three, created you to work with him. Both Genesis Chapter 1, verse 26 and 28 that I read earlier, God gave man rule over all creation. See, God created us to work with him. It says he commanded man to subdue the earth, to conquer, bring it to subjection, where we also need to be good stewards of the world. But God gave us rule. He gave us rule. He said, have dominion, take a command, take authority, have authority over all the earth and all over all creation, friends. And there's this creativity there. You know, Adam created with God in the garden. He was involved in partnership and naming the animals. I mean, what an incredible thing. And that was lost, but it's going to be restored later on. See, Adam was the original prince of this world. He was the one that was put in charge of everything. He was given a rule for everything. What, what happened? Well, sin happened. And we're going to see that in Genesis 3 in a few weeks. And man lost his position as the prince of this world. And now who is the prince of the world? Satan, the spiritual enemy, is the prince of the world. But there's a longing in the heart of man for what God originally planned in the garden. There's a desire to recapture what man lost, what mankind lost, what mankind gave away because of sin. And friends, that's going to happen. Well, God created you, friends. You're not an accident in nature. You are the pinnacle of all creation. You have value and purpose. And why did he create you? He created you to be in relationship with him, to glorify him, to work with him. Genesis 131, just two more scriptures before we go to prayer. Genesis 131, I read that earlier. God saw all he had made. And what does he say about it? It was very good. Friends, that's you. That's you. God rejoiced over all his over his creation. That's you. God chose you to rule with him. He chose you to be in relationship with him. Now that rule and that relationship was interrupted by sin, but the relationship can be restored now, even today, through salvation, accepting what Jesus did upon the cross, that he took your place. And you know, that relationship can be restored to the Father. And our rule will be restored. We will rule and reign with him, with Christ, and with the Father for all eternity, friends. What Satan was trying to destroy here in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis, the third chapter, we're gonna, as I mentioned, we're going to look at that in just a couple of weeks. What Satan was trying to destroy there, God brings to fulfillment in, in beautiful restoration in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 5. John the Revelator writes, There will be no more night. There will be no, there will, there will, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Friends, we're going to reign with the Father. We're going to reign with Christ Jesus forever and ever. You are a highly significant friend, deeply fallen, but greatly loved. I heard that years ago. There was a pastor on staff of the church where I met my wife and where we were married, Shoreline Community Church in North Seattle. Mike Kirkley used to say that over and over, highly significant, you're highly significant, deeply fallen, but greatly loved. God wanted to restore that relationship, and he did so through his son, Jesus Christ. When he died upon a cross, he took your place. He took my place. Now, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and friends, maybe you're hearing this for the very first time. 
And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your king and master, I want to invite you to surrender your life to him. Let him be your Lord and Savior, friends. There's nothing greater than surrendering yourself to the master of the universe. He created you. He can lead you. He can guide you. That's the place to put your life in his hands. Now, maybe you've served him in the past and you've gone away from him. You're not serving him now. And I want to cry out to you. I want to invite you. Come back to him. Come back to him. Surrender your life completely to him, friend. Why try to control your life on your own when you're not able to do that? Put your life in the hands of one of the one who created everything. Maybe you are serving him and you love the Lord with all your heart. I want to encourage you, friends, with a reminder that you are serving the one that's in control. He spoke the word and worlds were created, worlds put into place, space and man was formed out of ground by his hands. He created you. You have value and purpose. He wants to be in a relationship with him. And there's nothing too hard for him, whether your life now, friends, or your future. Give it to him. Give it all to him. Would you do that today? Amen. We're going to go to prayer right now. Are you ready? Let's do it. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. What a wonderful truth in your word. The record of creation that you formed man out of the dust of the ground. Lord, you got involved with man, and you still do that, Lord. You're involved with us in a very personal, affectionate way, Lord. Uh, you are so kind and caring for us. And I pray for each one, Lord, the, the one that's never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit would, would draw them to yourself and they would say yes to you. Lord, the one that's walked away and not serving you, Lord, they would come back to you. They would surrender their life to you. You who created them, Lord, you, you formed them. And Lord, you, 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 I don't know how it happens, but you do that. You're involved in each one of our lives and our birth and, our, and throughout our life, you desiring for each one of us to turn to you. Every man, every woman, every young person, every boy, every girl watching this, Lord, I pray that you speak their heart and they surrender their life to you. Lord, if that, if, if that person is serving you already, may they have great confidence that you're in control, Lord, if you can create this world out of nothing and create mankind out of the dust of the ground, Lord, then you, there's nothing too hard for you. There's nothing you cannot do. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, friends, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Aloha, aloha, care, cool. God loves you. God is love. Well, there's more good teaching coming up right here where you are. So I'll see you here next time. Until then, aloha. God bless. Bye-bye.